When I'm asked what a civil engineer does, my quick answer is, we design the infrastructure that connects us and brings us together. My passion for being a civil engineer runs deep. My father, who's one of the, one of the smartest men I've ever known, is a civil engineer. Both he and my grandfather designed and built established places that created for better communities. I can remember driving from our home north of Philadelphia to the, to the airport on the south side, and as we drove along the interstate, my grandfather pointed out all the sections of the road that he had built proudly. That moment stuck with me. Someday, I wanted to share his sense of pride for having created places that bring people together. But the interstate, like one's life purpose, is not so straightforward. We must learn from history, be mindful not to spoil what we have as we advance forward. So the interstate began when President Dwight Eisenhower enacted the Federal Aid Highway Act in the 1950s. The big idea was to connect every city of 50,000 or more residents with a high-speed, limited-access road network. Forty years later, over 40,000 miles of road had been built. Now, Eisenhower's interest in the interstate system actually began when he was an officer in the Army. He volunteered in 1919 to take part in the first motorized convoy across America. It was a difficult and at times treacherous trip from Washington, D.C., 3,200 miles to San Francisco that took 62 days. If you were to check your phone, you'd see that same trip can be done in 40 hours. You can drive across our country in a weekend. The impact the interstate system had on our country's economy and our culture of independence is hard to fully comprehend. It allowed us to travel between cities quickly and efficiently, while serving to grow the rural areas in between. It was America's greatest public infrastructure project of the 20th century, and it was an unprecedented success of connecting our nation. But, while the interstate connected the nation, it also divided communities. It's estimated that over one million businesses and individuals were displaced by the construction of the interstate system. These roads were lines on paper drawn by civil engineers, connecting points of interest in the most cost-effective route. And in urban areas, this was often the poorest and disproportionately minority communities. Almost every city has examples of valued spaces being divided from established communities with the highway system. The very stretch of Interstate 95 that inspired me to be a civil engineer separated the historic shipbuilding town of of or the historic shipbuilding town of uh, Fishtown from the Delaware River watershed. Here in Savannah, we have our own scars. Three of our historic squares were lost in the 1930s through the construction of U.S. Highway 17. We've recovered Franklin Square, but we still have Elbert and Liberty Square that are lost. Then, in the 1960s, Interstate 16 ran straight through Union Station, shown here, and over West Broad Street. It severed streets and divided Savannah's black historic business district. This is a Sanborn fire insurance map from the 1950s. All the boxes represent homes and businesses. The big yellow box in the middle is Central Station. This is that same map in the 1970s, after I-16 passed through. It is dramatic to see the loss of homes and businesses. The interstate system in mid-century housing policies had a dramatic effect on this neighborhood. There have been conversations to, to remove the section of Interstate 16 and reconnect the broken streets, but we can never regain the community lost. Now, as Americans were enjoying the great infrastructure expansion, they were also growing unsettled by the loss of historic, cultural, and natural spaces. By the end of 1960s, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. These two laws guaranteed transparency and provided an opportunity for communities to engage in a public meeting process. 
These meetings are critical to engineers. They provide the community an opportunity to be engaged and allow engineers and planners to see what can only be seen by living in a community and not on paper. Similarly, local grassroots organizations like Historic Savannah Foundation lobbied to get local ordinances passed that would also do similar practices in local Savannah and other areas. Recently, I was part of a, a planning team that was tasked with redeveloping a project just outside Savannah's historic district. We held a public meeting at a local church, and often, especially in recent times, these meetings can be contentious and sometimes adversarial with residents who don't want anything to change. This meeting was totally different. The residents were engaged, they wanted to see opportunities, they wanted to help contribute to the process, and one resident in particular from the housing, or from the, from the historic district, actually pointed out that the wall that ran along East Broad Street severed the community from the sidewalk that faced the street and made it feel separate from the historic district. I must have looked at that wall 50 times on paper and in the field. I saw the wall for what it was, but never fully appreciated what it was doing to divide the community, both physically and symbolically. I left that meeting feeling like the system was working, and I was uplifted by that individual that gained nothing as an individual, but helped me make for, make for a better community. We live in an era of growth and opportunity, and I am so excited to be part of it, especially in our local community. The Savannah Statesboro population is projected to grow by 34% by 2050. That is double the national average. That kind of growth will have a dramatic impact on our community, and we must prepare to take advantage of all the good while mitigating the negative impacts with good planning and strong infrastructure. I bring back the pictures from Eisenhower's trip across the United States. At the time of these pictures, no one could have possibly imagined the comforts and luxuries that we take for granted today. 62 days to drive cross-country, zero passenger airlines, 1% of households had indoor plumbing and electricity, no radio stations, no television, no internet, and no drive through caramel macchiatos. <laughs> America has one of the most advanced infrastructures in the world, and we are so fortunate to take advantage of what has been built for us. But progress is a journey and not a destination. There's a constant and perpetual need for good transportation, good utilities, digital communication, and infrastructure we have yet to comprehend. We all have our role to play in the community. And as we progress forward, I ask the following of us all. Support robust infrastructure that makes for a healthy, prosperous, and connected community. Look forward optimistically with a critical eye to avoid disproportionate harm. Engage. Attend public meetings. Bring your unique perspective and make our community better than it would have been had you not been part of the process. And last, think bigger than yourself. Think in the interest of the greater community. If no one could see a cell tower site from their backyard, none of us could search the drive time between two random cities. So if we support infrastructure optimistically, are willing to be engaged, are willing to change directions when needed, and act as a community, we can navigate to a brighter future. And in 30 years, when we look in the rearview mirror, we'll be proud of the road we pave for those who follow. <laughs>